time warnings? Uh, yeah, because I've got a demo, so if you can give me a time warm warning at uh, 15 minutes. Okay. okay. Hi, so welcome to the talk, thanks for attending. So today I'm going to be talking on a topic called transactions for micro microservices. Um, so it's a question, so it's a question I'm going to be asking, are transactions appropriate for using in microservices in dive environments? So three main areas I'm going to discuss today. So first I'm going to talk about um, transactions, um, whether you can... Yeah, so talking about transactions and how they might be applied in a microservice environment and uh, go through some, like, um, some concepts some, um, and why they might be used, uh, why you might need some, this kind of approach in a microservice environment. After that, I'll be talking about a community project called Eclipse Microprofile. So they're building a set of APIs with implementations for using in microservice environments. Um, and we'll be talking about an implementation of one of those specs called Narion LRA. Um, and then I'll be finishing off with a demonstration of some code. I'm sorry, my hearing's not that good, but I can't hear you. Speak up. Yeah, Even louder than I am, yeah? Perhaps <coughs> move up the, move up the link, maybe? Yeah. If I talk directly, oh, that's better, isn't it? Okay. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you adjust it a little bit? Okay. Let's see this actually. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. Okay, is that better? Can you hear me? Great. Okay, so to motivate the work, so it um, starts off with the premise systems can fail. Um, machines and networks um, and software fail as well. So things are improving. Machines, software, hardware is getting more and more reliable. Software development techniques have become more mature. And it's clear that, um, that the incidences of failures are getting lower. But in this modern digital computing, we are moving more and more to scale. As, we, um, as more and more functions in the, in the modern world become digitized. So when you start running at scale, it's, um, it's, it's going to happen that you're going to get failures, no matter how reliable your hardware is. So you, well, historically, we also had failures with like, um, centralized systems. Um, and we've had a lot of like, um, work put, done into that and over the decades. And we've made them more and more reliable. Um, and that's culminated in the Java applications, in application servers, in particular the Java application server. So with um, distributed systems, that's like a, that takes the, the management problem and the management of failures over to a whole new level. Uh, microservices is of clearly like a distributed system, and there's an acknowledgement that you know that you can't if you can't guarantee your hardware and software is not going to fail, you're going to have to embrace failure. And the mantra is, um, you've got to like provide mechanisms, techniques to make like failure a first-class citizen in your environment. So, um, so the, the microservices community, they've come up with various techniques to make, uh, to, to like handle failure. So they can include things like, um, like health probes, liveness probes, etc. Uh, the management system will then like monitor what's going on and then like maybe start new, new, um, new spin up new machines if things are failing. You've got timeouts. Um, you can do load balancing if you've detected that one of your loads is running more slowly. Um, you can scale up and down depending on if you think that things are becoming faulty or, or you've got a latency in your system. So, and we think that transactions is really is part of this ethos. It's um, and that should be allowed to be part of your toolkit. It's not it's not the solution, but it should be one of the solutions that you can apply to building your systems. <coughs> So the question is um, to be answered is what exactly is a transaction and how is it going to help me building microservices um, based systems. 
So a transaction is a, me is a mechanism, a means by which you can move a system from one known good state to a second known good state. Um, and while you're doing that, at the end of the state, you can got, you've got certain guarantees, certain correctness guarantees. So effectively, it provides like an all or nothing guarantee. So you like if, uh, if you move your system and something goes wrong, then at the end of the transaction, you want to be able to revert things. Um, so the, there's not just one model of transactions, uh, there are many different ones, so you've, you've probably heard of the JTA model, which is like built based on um, an old DEX open standard called XA. Um, so that JTA model, that like provides full, full, full guarantees in the system, but there are other models, so there's things like Sagas, it's a compensation based approach, um, there's like uh, business activities from the Oasis group, uh, and there's also many different flavours of, of different protocols. So let's start off first define what exactly is a transaction model. So like I said, there's not one transaction model, but you can, this, all transaction models have various, various like properties. So they all ex exhibit these four properties of atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. And by looking and investigating those four properties, it gives you a way of like characterizing a particular transaction model. And it also allows you to like compare and contrast the different models. So the, um, the, the atoms, so the, so the image that I've got there on the right, that's just saying that you don't have to have all four of these different properties. You know, so if you like, you might relax one of the, one of the properties, so that, that example, you've got three test, three test tubes, so you relax one property, and then you've got varying, varying degrees of that characteristic in that particular model. Um, so a model that would display all four properties and have all four a full, a full implementation of those four, four concepts, and that would be an example of a JTA model. Um, so, if I go through what each one is briefly, so atomicity is saying that when you run a set of operations, you want all those operations to either run to run as a single unit of work. So, when you finish to run the set of operations, you want all of the operations to complete, or none of them to complete. So, that would be full atomicity. Second property is consistency, so that's an application from the application developer's point of view. So he's built his application, and his business application provides certain guarantees, certain invariants, um, and then so the so before you start running the transaction, there's an invariant so that's, that's that you can rely on, and at the end of the transaction, it is moved to the states, moved to another invariant of the system, and that's saying that the system is consistent from the application's point of view. So in between the start and end of that transaction, then you can uh, have inconsistent states. Um, so that's why we have to introduce a third property called isolation. So you want to be able to isolate that inconsistency from other transactions running the system. So two transactions cannot see what, an, um, what each of them are doing in between the transaction. And finally, there's durability. So if you want your changes in the transaction to persist at the end of the transaction. So the, in the JTA world, when you um, the, the typical protocol that you run to like to like commit to enforce those four properties of your system is called two-phase commit protocol. Um, so that's so there's two phases. First is the voting phase. So there's a, there's a coordinator, transaction manager, and he'll go around and ask all the parties that have been involved in the transaction. So this is with dis distributed transactions where you've got multiple parties involved. And he'll say to each one, "Can you commit? Are you prepared to commit all the changes that you've done?" within this transaction and once he's got the answer back from all the different parties the transaction manager will write a durable log representing that decision so the durable log is important because you can have a failure at that point and if the um, and if it crashes before it's gone through and committed all the participants then the transaction manager has no knowledge of what um, of that transaction and you got and therefore you're going to lose you're going to lose your, your atomicity in fact you're going to lose a lot of these properties if you don't have your transaction log and then the final phase, so if all the different parties say that they're prepared to go and uh, commit the work, then, go and, then the commit phase will go and commit each one. So even with that one, that's, that's the generally accepted way of doing distributed transactions. That is not a perfect solution because there are very, there are failure windows in there. So the first failure window is during the voting, voting phase before you've actually written a durable log. So if the, if the manager, transaction manager fails before that point, then all of these different parties are left in a limbo state. So they, uh, in order to get to provide the commit the guarantees of this acid, these acid properties, it will have to go and start locking data and, and writing logs. So that was going to um, bottleneck your system. 
Um, so typically, the, the, uh, so the parties have to log some information as well, and that puts like um, put, puts an onus on them to like t to manage that data correctly. Because like when this when this transaction come back again, it needs to go and ask all the different parties it's aware of, and ask them, are you, uh, have you got any any ongoing transactions? And the other window is that is when you go on during the commit phase. So the transaction manager is going to be committing each each party one at a time, commits the first party, and clearly at that point you've lost your isolation because the other transactions can now see that committed bit of work before all of the other parties have been committed. So that's yeah. So what about using transactions for microservices? So uh, microservice um, interactions, um, typically what you do the, is you start with um, a monolith. You've got a monolith that's running inside an application server, and, the, um, and you want to break that monolith down up into different uh, services, and you want to run those in, set on separate machines in, in the network, in the cloud. Um, so for a start, you've got many different parties involved, so that increases the complexity. Um, so once the system's actually been broken up and you're talking to microservice environment, there's a there'll be a strong uh, propensity to go and like use uh, to plug in other people's APIs, you know. For, like um, so, you might want to like you know do, 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 only only concentrate on your core core strengths. So you want to be able to use someone who does better ordering, so someone who does better billing systems. So you're going to have to start crossing trust boundaries as well when you move to a microservice environment. Um, and also, typically, a microservices um, business um, business activity will can, can go on for long periods of time. You know, it can last for minutes, hours. You know. So something, if you're going to have transactions in this kind of environment, you need something to be able to coordinate all these different activities. Otherwise, otherwise the system's going to be like because you're going to have to have a lot of requirements, a lot of like um, sort of um, responsibilities on other services that because like if it's trust boundaries, you don't really have any influence over. So you need some kind of thing to coordinate all of that. And so the question really boils down to: Can we use full asset transactions to achieve that correctness? So clearly you can do because we have been building bi distributed systems since the 60s and 70s. Um, but is it appropriate for this um, for, for modern modern computing at scale? Um, so the problem with full acid is that um, it, clearly that two two phase commit protocol it's a blocking protocol. Also, to achieve the isolation, typically you think um, are, so you're going to have to lo um, provide locks on data. Although typically, you like your locks and data is only if you use optimistic locking during the transaction, and then at the um, at the final two-phase commit um, phase uh, part of the protocol, that's when you actually do the locking. But still, failures during that that phase as well, you can block. Um, Isolation as well. So if you like, if you've got to guarantee isolation between different transactions, then that's going to like um, that's going to tie your hands if you're in terms of like in terms of like parallel processing. Um, the database community did acknowledge that that was a problem, and they've came up with like the um, a set of the, um, isolation levels, so things like repeatable reads. Um, you know, if you've read one bit of data during this transaction and you read it again, it's guaranteed to be the same value. You know. Like, um, You've got to be committed, so and read it in uncommitted data, etc. So the highest level is serializable. serializable. So that's serializable. That would make, effectively mean that if you run two transactions, they effectively look as though they've been run one after the other consecutively. And that's the um, that's the that's the one that impacts impacts availability um, the greatest. There's also um, a piece of like a theorem from um, academic literature, literature called the CAP theorem. So the CAP theorem's concerns about um, consistency and availability. So um, in the presence of partitions, so if two services in the environment, if they lose co of co connectivity um, because of a, um, a broken network, or because the machine's gone down, or because the service itself is is running slowly, um, and then that's what's called those two services have become partitioned. So if a two services become partitioned, then the CAP theorem states that you can't guarantee full consistency and full availability. So in this kind of system, you have to be able to relax one of those if you want to be able to make progress. And in a, dis in a microservice environment, um, availability is key because that's why you've gone for the microservice to get the scale um, and, 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 to, and to get the responsiveness of your systems. So really, it's like down to like um, looking at how you can like um, what you can do with with, with, uh, with respect to consistency. 
So full assay, this clearly is not an optimal solution in these kind of loosely coupled um, systems where you've got long duration activities. So if you can't use full acid, what uh, the, the option is, is to start looking at those set of four properties that characterize all transaction models and start thinking about which, which ones of those you can start relaxing or even do without in, in some cases. So as I go through the four acid um, properties to like, make it concrete, I'll, I'll refer to a simple, a simple case of where you might be trying to book a seat on a plane and some travel insurance, and you want to do those in a side of transaction. So in a conventional two phase, uh, in an acid, full acid transaction, you would have to book those two things as a one atomic operation. So either they're both booked or neither of them would be booked. So if you want to relax atomicity, that all, all or nothing guarantees, um, then you might want to, in your transaction, you might want to like, cancel some, some work while allowing other work to continue. So in the, in the example we've got, the travel insurance example, you might, um, you might go away, you might book the, book the flight, um, and then you don't want to like, have, um, unbook the flight if you can't get your travel insurance because you might be able to get your travel insurance some, some, some later time down the line. So that's a case where you want to break at atomicity. Um, so the, a more a conventional approach to handling that kind of um, break of atomicity is with um, nested transactions. Um, so you don't get nested transactions with JTA, but you do with a lot of other models. So say like the object transactions uh, service from Corb, for example, they had um, nested transactions. So that's where you can do some of the work inside a nested transaction, and then if you decide you don't want to do that nested work, you can cancel it, and it won't affect the top level transaction, which will continue running. So if, if you book your flight in the top level transaction, that's still there, and then you've just like cancelled the work you've done with the insurance. Second possible property to relax is um, is about consistency. So you might have heard in terms of when people talk about transactions for the cloud and for microservices, for microservices environments, they talk about the idea of eventual consistency. So as long as the system eventually comes to some kind of agreed consistent state, then that's often satisfactory for a lot of system, for a lot of um, applications. But uh, eventual consistency is a very weak guarantee. So when the, when, when the system and the data will converge on, the, on a consistent value, that's indeterminate. It can happen at uh, arbitrary times in the future. Also, once it's converged, it can quickly start diverging again. But that can be mitigated um, with application knowledge. So typically, you would combine it with timeouts. So if you're waiting for um, some state that you, that you want to be consistent and it hasn't um, happened within a certain period of time, then you can time out that work and go and try a, diff a different approach, try a different strategy. Or 15 minutes, OK, or abort it completely. Um, so the next one is isolation. Um, so you, when you start, so as we said earlier, I think in isolation you have to be able to relax isolation because isolation is requires a, it's a, a lot of light work on behalf of the application developer to isolate work from other other other, other applications. So you might want to commit work early. Um, um, yes, yeah, so I'll skip through that one. And also the durability aspect. So typically, you, you want your work to be the work you've done to be durable and to, and to persist after you've completed your, your, your transaction. Um, but the uh, STM software transactional memory that, the memory that is a good example of where you would like relax durability. So, in a software transactional memory system that has like the, uh, of the acid properties that has like atomicity, consistency, and isolation, um, but it doesn't have the durability. And typically, you'd use that for like high-scale concurrent systems, object-based systems. So you've got your objects, and you're making changes to your objects with many concurrent threads operating on these objects, updating state. And then when you come to commit at the end of your of, of your transaction, you find that there's been like um, there's, there's, uh, there's been a problem, then you can just uh, abort it and start again. So in that case, you wouldn't necessarily want to do durability. Um, so how do we go about choosing which set of properties to use? So we approached the micro, micro profile community, discussed it with them, came up with some new use cases. So we need, knew that scalability was the concert, was, was the main thing to, to look at. Um, so um, full acid wa wasn't proposed. 
uh, we need to remove locking so we need to like something that's where different different business act activities can see what each other are doing so you need to drop isolation um, and you just basically you want to make sure you, you get as much work done and much forward progress as possible before backing out we knew we wanted um, nested transactions we knew we wanted to be a time bound um, time bound the, the, the operations time bound the period in which the undue compensation activities can be can be can be guaranteed to be to, to run um, and also comp composition of of of, of the, these like the, these transactions we call them long running actions and also to be able to compose them and, and run them in run the compensations within long run actions as well so the result was um, a draft specification so we submit that to micro community. Uh, we have a weekly meeting, a weekly hangout where we go through all the different uh, the stakeholders, go through the different issues and different problems with the spec. So it's still open. It's still available for like people to like make contributions to it. Um, uh, it provides um, my profile is a CDI first environment, so, so, we, so we define a set of CDI annotations by which you can um, by which you can start these long running actions and by which you can register callbacks for the compensation the completion activities. Um, there's also a pure Java API for people that don't use um, Java uh, for don't use CDI annotations. Um, and also, we've got um, a group that want that have their own implementation of, of a SARC like uh, model that uses gRPC and um, Google prototype buffer so we separate separated out the transport aspects from the CDI annotations that define the model um, so this is um, a sequence diagram of, of our Narion implementation of it so the actual specification is defined in terms of like a set of CDI annotations as I said and the, and the, and the map of the transport so this is how we implemented it um, so I'm going to skip over that one and go straight to the demos so in the demo we used various pieces of technology so we've used the OpenShift um, platform, OpenShift is built on top of Kubernetes um, it provides some extra um, some management um, ma management um, functions on top of Kubernetes and also the build and the CDI deployment pi pipeline um, we've also used the Narayana, Narayana is, the transa is a transaction manager toolkit and we use that to build the, um, the prototype implementation of this specification and also the Wildfly Swarm which is now called Thorntail but they haven't got a logo for it yet so Thorntail is like a, a way to get a cut down version of Wildfly, the Wildfly application server so it's cut down, it has just what you need inside it effectively it produces a fat jar and it's just a fat jar that you can jar for jar for jar that you can run in a, in a JVM um, so this is what the demo is. So the demo is booking, uh, it's booking a hotel and booking a flight. Um, so the um, the initial state is to book a hotel. And to book the hotel, we run that in in a top level um, route, long run the action. And then the flight bookings, we want to have two strategies. We want to book, uh, so we've come to book the flight. We can't find an economy one, so okay, the, uh, we say okay, we'll have a first class flight, flight, but we might want to later go back and cancel that and go back to an economy class. So we've run that in a nested, in a nested long running action. So the idea there is that you can go and cancel the first class flight and then like have another go at booking an economy flight. So you're not going to lose your hotel booking. Uh, and then after we've done that, we're going to cancel, so cancel one of the flights, and then close the LRA. And the transaction, and, and the thing that's managing these LRAs will then make sure it calls into all the different um, different services that have registered with the LRA. So if you, if, so for example, if you cancel the whole the whole um, operation, then the um, the transaction manager will ensure that it goes back and calls all the different callbacks to tell them to compensate for the work they did. So the hotel booking could be to like refund refund the customer. Um, so there's a deep dive there. If you, have, if you do want to, have these these slides are online. If you want to have a look at what we've done, so let's have a look at running the demo. How long have we got now? Um. Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Okay, so quickly, so yeah, what I've got there, this is the set of annotations. So, for example, to start an LRA, you would annotate one of your methods with an at LRA annotation. So, there you've got things like required, requires new. Uh, if, you have, if you're familiar with JTA, it's, it's model on JTA. So with those annotations, so for example, if you put a mandatory LRA annotation on a method and there's no LRA context, context available when that, when that method is called, then it'll throw an exception, for example. 
Um, okay, so um, so let's have a look. So we got. Yeah, I'm running a bit on short on time, so I think if it's probably best if I just run the demo. <coughs> right, but firstly I'll say, this, so there's three services running, the trip service. So the trip service is one that does the booking, that coordinates the booking of the hotel and also the flight services. So there's, then there's one for the hotel service and, and there's another one for the for the flight service as well. So if we start the services running, so this one is the, that's the hotel service. This one's the flight service running. Uh, so this is what I mean by the flat jar. So Java minus jar, and then there's the flat jar is like a thorn tail. It's, it's like a, th a cut down version of Wildfire Fly, and that's so that's got the bundle. In, that's bundle inside it is the various services that we're running. We also need a coordinator. So when different when these microservices um, register compensation activities for, with the LRA, that they might want to be compensated for if the, if the transaction is subsequently rolled back, uh, um, closed, cancelled. Sorry, then it needs to register this information with the coordinator. So we've got two coordinators running in the same environment. There's a there's, that's the bottom right one, that's the, the one for the sub-transactions, and then we've got another coordinator. So the coordinators can be federated in the system, they don't also all have to be running in the same, in the same JVM, because they can talk to each other. Uh, and then this is the main coordinator. So when you do a trip, bu trip booking, the trip booking is going to go to the main coordinator um, and register with that one. And then the flight service that does it, does it in a nested LRA, that one will go and register with the subordinates, with, with the subordinate coordinator. Okay, so, so that's the services all running. So what we've got now is, so this shell script, so this shell script is going to, it's going to go and make a call to the to the trip service uh, microservice, and it's going to ask it to go and book a hotel and book the flight. Um, so if we run that, okay. So that's gone and done the booking, and that URL I've printed out there. That's the URL that you have to give to the, um, to tell the, the trip the uh, the trip microservices to complete the booking. And what the trip microservice um, uh, will then do is it'll then go and and, com um, and confirm the um, confirm the long running action. So if I type copy that, run that one. So that's gone there and, and run it, and, and that's gone um, and closed the LRA, and then the um, and then the LRA has then closed all the completion callbacks for the various microservices that were registered with this long running action, and you can see the aggregate booking. They're all they're all in the status confirmed. So you can also do one with um, cancel as well. I see we didn't get a first class ticket. Yes, you have got to go. Got to get economy if it's available. <laughs> And similarly, if you decide you want to abort the whole the whole trip, then you would um, you'd tell after trip control to cancel the cancel the whole, the whole trip, and that would then just close the LRA, and then the LRA would do all the right callbacks. So the so the trip manager, the trip manager microservice doesn't have to like, cope with all the complexities of cancelling everything and shutting everything down because it's already registered all the logic with the. With the um, with the coordinator, and effectively in this environment, it's a, it's a REST-based system which is in JAX RS, so they're just all the endpoints that it's registered. Um, there is a second part of the demo which um, which is running on on MiniShift. So MiniShift is um, is an OpenShift environment that you can run locally. Oh, let me make sure I've got the. Start the console. So I have already deployed these three microservices and also the coordinators into MiniShift, um, and this is like this is showing them all running. So there's the flight coordinator, there's a hotel coordinator, uh, LRA coordinator. So now we can 
we can interact with the um, with the OpenShift environment with these services running in that environment. So I've pre some of the commands. So this is going to the the trip microservice. So that's the this is the uh, endpoint on which it's listening. So if I run that one. So with Kubernetes, you have service-based URLs, which and then you have the actual pods that implement the, the, the services running behind that service. So that's what that min shift IP, et cetera, is doing. Um, so that's created a book. That will have created a booking ID. So the booking IDs I'm using are actually the um, the IDs for the um, for the long running actions. So that's like you could have a mapping between the long running the booking IDs and long running actions. But for simplicity, booking IDs are the same as these long running action IDs. So that's the booking ID that we've got back from um, from starting the um, starting the booking and then to finish the booking, you put request to the to the um, trip service and then that will go and close the um, the long running action that's running in the coordinator that I've also deployed to the um, to mini shift and that's showing them all confirmed um, you can uh, two minutes another example would be to, sh to show that you can bounce the coordinator so you can start that running so that what I've done there is I've started a booking going the uh, the long running action is is in progress and then what I can do is go to the coordinator so here's the coordinator so with open shift I can scale down so if I scale that one down so when that scales down to zero that means there's no coordinator running in the environment so it's, this is just going to show that there's some uh, resilience in the system so the whole point of transactions and models is you have reliable guarantees so when things crash and things fail then you can always come back up and start from where and continue where you left off so that's scaled down so if i scale that back up again then once it's back up again i should still be able to complete that um, that trip booking so So I'll bounce the, um, the coordinator and then I can ask the trip microservice to complete the booking. And there it has complete the booking even so it demonstrates how the coordinator does maintain state and it does remember how that, that it's what, which long running actions it's responsible for. All right. Time is up. Okay, so that's good because that's where we are. We have a, a break between now and there's a, there's a break now between now and the next session. I think it's about 25 minutes. So if you want to ask him some questions offline out of the session, you can do so with this session. Is and if you take a look at the slides, there's like various links of where you can find out more information about what we're doing. So the Ariana project, which implements the transaction manager, and the presentations there as well, and also information about the micro four five weekly hangouts we have. So and that's the place you go if you want to contribute contribute any um, any input about what you might want to have changed. So for example, like I said before, we had some guys from China. They're working on a SARG project and they did contribute changes to make sure that we can support things other than just REST-based systems. Okay, any questions? The, there's no time for questions. Oh, okay. Right, offline questions then. Thank you. Enough time, huh? There's not, is there? No. It just goes by like this. Yeah, I think I 20, feel bad thir 35 it. minutes is just quite a short time. Yeah. Presentations. Yeah, There's normally 50 minutes.